Okay, we're going to talk about orbital velocity, and if you'll remember when we talked about the universal law of gravitation, then we talked about objects that have a force of gravity attracting them. So think about like, let's say maybe the Earth for this, and then the Moon. We'll say that the Earth has a mass of Me, and we'll just say that the Moon has a mass of M. So that's kind of easier to see. I'm going to draw a little bit bigger. M. Now, the force that attracts the two doesn't do much to the Earth. It just kind of makes the Earth wobble a little bit. For the Moon, that force acts as a centripetal force because the Moon has a forward velocity that it completes its orbits with. Sometimes we call that the orbital velocity. We'll talk about that, obviously. And the centripetal force that is always changing the direction of that is the force of gravity. So remember we know that a centripetal force is always equal to the mass of the thing that's you know going in a circle uh, times the velocity squared divided by the radius, mv squared over r. And this problem gives us the force of gravity, but we know the force of gravity really is the mass of thing one, the mass of thing two over r squared times the gravitational constant. So we can set these two equations equal to each other, and with the moon and the earth, we'll call the moon m and the earth m e, then we can say g mass of the earth times the mass of the moon divided by the distance between them, we'll call that r. Remember that's the radius of this circular path, uh, or the distance between their centers. We'll call that r. That's equal to m, the mass of the moon, times v squared over r. Now, if you can see it, the mass of the moon cancels out, and one of these r's cancels out. So that what we're left with is g times the mass of the Earth divided by the distance between their centers uh, is equal to v squared. And if we take the square root, then we get that the velocity, the linear velocity, which we are now referring to as the orbital velocity, is equal to the square root of the gravitational constant times the mass of the thing that's being orbited. And in this case, we're talking about the moon orbiting the Earth. Uh, divided by the distance of the orbit, which we can call r. So this is our equation for orbital velocity. Notice that it does not depend on the mass of the thing that's orbiting. So like here, it doesn't matter if the moon is one kilogram or 300 million thousand and fifty something kilograms. It doesn't matter. It only depends on the mass of the thing that is being orbited, so in this case the Earth, and then also the distance from the center, or the orbital distance. So let's see how this works. Here you have a 500 kilogram satellite orbiting the Earth, which the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth are listed. We know that the satellite is 200 kilometers from the surface of the Earth, and we want to find the speed of that satellite. Okay, well, if we draw the Earth, here's the Earth, and then we have the satellite. I'm going to give it a mass of m because if you didn't know, satellite is the word that we describe anything that orbits a planet. So a moon is a satellite. So this should look just exactly like what we did. Force of gravity down. So we get to the exact same place. Set those equal to each other. Where you get that the velocity is the square root of g m e over r. Okay, so when I plug this information in, I'm going to get 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons meters squared over kilograms squared. And then I multiply that by the mass of the Earth. The mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And then I divide that by the radius, r. Now, here's the thing. The radius of the orbit is the radius of the Earth plus the distance from the surface, or that 2,000, or sorry, 200 kilometers, which is 200,000 meters, or 2 times 10 to the fifth meters. So you have to add those two together, which in this case is 6.37 times 10 to the sixth meters, plus 2 times 10 to the fifth meters. Okay, when I put this all together, I will get that the orbital velocity is 7,791.67, we'll just call it 7 meters per second. So that's the orbital velocity. 
All right, now let's talk about this problem. A small moon is orbiting a mysterious planet X at a given radius. So here's our planet. We'll say that it has a mass of mx. Here's our small moon. We'll say that it has a mass of m. And we know that there is some distance between them, which we're going to call r. And of course, it's going in a circle. Okay, great. Now, if I write the equation for orbital velocity, which is v equals um, square root g mass of planet x over r, and I think about this as the sort of original velocity, then I can figure out what the new velocity is by quadrupling, quadrupling the radius um, and, and trying to see if I can get the old velocity out, of, out for my new velocity. So let me tell you what I'm talking about. Let's call this thing your old velocity. Okay, so that's your old velocity. When you have your new velocity, we'll call that v new, we are going to have the same gravitational constant, the same mass of planet x, but now what has changed is instead of r, we have 4 r, right? Four times the radius. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to see if I can find the old velocity inside of this new equation. What I mean is if I factor out root 1 over 4, then I can multiply that by g mx over r. Take a second to see if that makes sense to you, what I just did. Now why I just did this was because it tells me that the new velocity is root 1 over 4 times the old velocity. Or root 1 over 4 really is just half. So the new velocity is half of the old velocity, which means when you quadruple the radius, the orbital speed is halved. That has to do with the inverse square law. Um, as you get further and further away from the planet, the amount of speed that you would have decreases significantly uh, because the force of gravity is getting less and less and less as the distance between the objects uh, is squared. All right, now let's talk about something called orbital period. Orbital period is simply the amount of time it takes for one orbit. So think about like the Earth. The orbital period for the Earth going around the sun is... 365 days. Good, right, for the Earth. What would the orbital period for the moon around this Earth be? Well, one day. Hopefully you, you get this idea. Okay, so orbital period, um, we normally use T for period. Remember that T is the amount of time for one thing. And to give ourselves an idea of this, let's go back to the moon going around the Earth. Okay, the moon has a velocity v, that centripetal force, which is the force of gravity acting inwardly. And I'm going to write this here so that I remember the Earth also has that same force. And if I think about the velocity and I pretend that this orbital period is a circle, then I can actually say that the orbital velocity is equal to 2 pi r, which again, r is the distance of or the radius of this orbit, so the distance between the centers, divided by the orbital period t. Now if I want to solve for the orbital period, right, I can write t equals 2 pi r over v. But remember, we now know what the orbital velocity is as it depends on the gravitational constant. In this case, we'll use the Earth, the mass of the thing being orbited, and the radius of the orbit. So we can plug that into our equation and get t is equal to 2 pi r over root g m e over r. But I'm going to clean this up. I don't like that so much. I'm going to flip the fraction. So 2 pi r times root r over g m e. I'm going to see if I can combine that some more. Um, when you have r, really this is r to the 2 over 2. And I can split this fraction, so it's root, root, and root r is really r to the 1 half. So I can combine this to become 2 pi r 3 halves over root g m e. Okay, so this is the equation for the orbital period. Sometimes, though, it's best to just get a number for the orbital velocity if you can, and then to plug that into 
this equation to solve for what the period is going to be. You only really need to use this equation for the period t um, if you are directly asked to derive it, so to do what we just did, or if you're asked to manipulate the equation, which we'll, we'll take a look at them. All right, so here is a fun one. What is the height above the Earth's surface at which all synchronous satellites, regardless of mass, must be placed in orbit? So a synchronous satellite, satellite is something whose orbit takes one day. Now, one day is 24 hours, or what, 24 times how many minutes are in an hour? 60 minutes, how many seconds? So you get a total of 86,400 seconds, which if we want to, we can write that as 8.64 times 10 to the fourth seconds. So that's how many seconds it takes for this orbital period to take. Okay, uh, and the reason why we want to do that is because when you use g, 6.67 uh, times 10 to the negative 11th newtons per meter squared over kilogram squared. When you use this number for g, you're using newtons. And remember that a newton is a kilogram times a meter uh, per second squared. So you need it to be in seconds to agree with this number that we use for g, which sucks. You'll, you'll see. Okay, so anyway, this is the amount of time that it takes to orbit in seconds. And it doesn't matter what the mass is. We just need to figure out what the height will be. So here's the Earth. And you know that there's the radius of the Earth plus this height that we're going to call h to get to our satellite. And the satellite is going in a circle. OK, so the velocity of that satellite um, is a linear velocity. We know that it's going to be equal to 2 pi r over t. So if you want to find the velocity using our equation, root g mass of the Earth over the distance r, then we can plug that in to find the velocity. But I'm going to go ahead and use uh, the mass of the Earth equation to find the velocity instead of using our orbital period equation. That's to say the equation that we just came up with, sorry. So t is equal to 2 pi r to the 3 halves over root g m e. Now, this is kind of weird, but what I want to find is the total distance r so that I can then say what h is. Uh, and if I want to use this equation to find the total distance r, then it's, it's kind of bizarre. Basically, I'm going to get r by itself. So I have r to 3 halves equals, I flip this whole fraction. So I get t root g m e, divide all that by 2 pi. And then if you don't know how to inverse um, an exponential like this, basically, you're just going to flip it, meaning you multiply this by 2 over 3. So the orbital period is 8.64 times 10 to the fourth seconds. You multiply that by the root of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons times meter squared over kilogram squared times the mass of the Earth, uh, which from our last problem that we worked on was 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. So 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. We divide all of that by 2 pi. And we take this number uh, and put it to the 2 thirds power. So after a year in your calculator, you should get 4.23 times 10 to the seventh meters. You should maybe see if you can get that for the radius. Now to get the height, h, you need to recognize that this is really equal to re plus h. So to find h, you need to take that radius, r, and subtract re from it, right? Because you needed more steps. So 4.23 
times 10 to the seventh meters minus, that's right, the radius of the Earth, which if you remember from our uh, older problem, the radius of the Earth is given by 6.37 times 10 to the sixth. So 6.37. Times 10 to the 6th. And that gives you a walloping 3.59 times 10 to the 7th meters, which I believe is roughly about 22,000 miles. So since it takes so much time to solve these problems with actual numbers, what the AP test will generally do is give you kind of logical questions. Um, now, on a free response question, they would ask you to uh, come up with the equation for the orbital period t as like part a of the free response. Uh, but they would also tell you what it's supposed to come out to. So that for part b, when you are using the equation, you have the correct equation to work with. So let's assume you approach this problem and you can't prove, but you know that the orbital period is equal to 2 pi r to the 3 halves over root uh, g times the mass of, in this case we have a moon, orbiting planet x, so it would be the mass of planet x. So let's say you, were able to, you weren't able to get here, but they gave you the equation anyway, and then they asked you this. How much more time would it take the moon, orbiting the mysterious planet x, uh, to complete one orbit if the mass of planet x was nine times larger? So here's why it's a lot easier to kind of logically apply um, algebra rules than it is to actually use numbers. So just like before, let's go ahead and call this our old orbital period, right? That's the time it took for one orbit. That's our or old orbital period. What we want to do is find out what the new orbital period is. Now in the new orbital period, nothing changes about 2 pi, right? 2 pi r is still a thing. Uh, and the radius stays the same, so we can say r to the 3 halves is the same. And root g stays the same because it's a gravitational constant. But here we have our new difference. Instead of mx, we have 9 times mx. So I'm going to write 9mx. Okay, now the goal is to take this new orbital period and see if we can get a fraction times the old. Maybe you already see it. We're going to take that 9 that's in the root and we're going to pull it out. So we have 1 over root 9 times 2 pi r to the 3 halves over root g m x. I should be careful to make sure that you see that that's a 9 and then that's a subscript. Okay. Because uh, let's be honest, this all looks very similar. All right, now hopefully you can now see that this is really 1 third times the old period. Or the new orbital period would be a third of the old one, meaning it would take a lot longer. I'm sorry, shorter, because there was more mass, and therefore there's more of a force of gravity, and so more of a centripetal force. Congratulations. You did it. You're awesome. Yay.